Good morning, everybody. Happy Respiratory Care Week to everyone, and welcome to Respiratory Associates' presentation on APRV. My name is Keith Farns, and I've been producing live respiratory continuing education courses since 1996. My friend Joe Lewis, famous for his Respiratory Coach YouTube channel, will be presenting the topic this morning. It is approved by the AARC for one live CRCE credit hour. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Lewis. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Keith, uh, for that. I would go easy uh, with the word famous, but nonetheless, I am so happy to be here. Can I just say happy uh, Respiratory Care Week to everyone here in attendance and anybody who may watch this later on down the road? Um, there's no better way, in my opinion, to kick off Respiratory Care Week than by jumping into and learning something new. Uh, maybe you're just brushing up on your skills. Maybe you already have a good basis of APRV and just here for the CEU. Whatever it is, I'm sure you could probably be at a free lunch somewhere and, uh, or breakfast at this point. And, and instead, you're here learning. So I think that shows dedication to your craft and, and is what Respiratory Care Week is all about ultimately. Now today, we are going to jump into um, breaking down what seems sometimes to be um, a mode of mechanical ventilation that is seriously from another planet. Uh, you know, we learn all these traditional modes of mechanical ventilation in school and you go out there and you start working with all the standard modes. And then one day you walk in and you have a patient APRV and you're completely shocked. What do I do? How do I operate this mode? I've only used it a couple or a handful of times and, and, and that's okay because you have to work with it to get comfortable with it. Um, and today I hope to make it seem not so foreign, maybe turn it into a friend so that you feel more comfortable when using APRV. Got a handful of objectives here today. First of all, we're gonna identify what APRV stands for. We're gonna identify the key settings that you must know and know how to set. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, how APRV helps to improve gas exchange. And then we'll talk about a couple of different patient scenarios and how you will adjust APRV in, uh, in response to an arterial blood gas or, in, or a patient situation. Now, the first time, first thing when you get into understanding any mode, especially in the medical field, you know sometimes it seems like alphabet soup. It seems like, man, there's just so many acronyms. The first step is knowing what the acronyms stand for. And if you do that, then you're well on your way to understanding uh, what the mode does. So, for example, APRV stands for airway pressure release ventilation. Now, that may not mean much to you right now, but by the time we're done, I think those words will have a different meaning to you when you realize that we're dealing with airway pressures. They're going to release, and we're also going to have an aspect of ventilation that happens in the middle of all this happening. So, understanding what the acronyms mean, a lot of times will make things make sense to you. Um, okay, we're going to start with settings because I think that's one of the uh, first places you need to start with any mode of mechanical ventilation is understanding what do I need to set when I want to put a patient into APRV. Okay, now here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to go to a physician, say, um, hey, Dr. Jenkins, that's just a random name. Uh, we need to put this patient in APRV or I think this patient would benefit from APRV. This is a, this patient's uh, criteria meets that of APRV. So, so let's try. And the physician responds and says, fantastic, what settings would you like to use? And then your response is, is well, I don't, I don't know the settings. I just had the idea of APRV. I thought you would know the settings. That's, that's not how you want this to go. You want to be able to go with a game plan suggest APRV, but then also show knowledge in suggesting that you know what you're going to set and how you're going to set it. So there's only four settings in APRV, and uh, they're really quite simple when you start breaking them down. The first one we see here is pressure high, okay? So the pressure high is the first pressure that we're going to set, and pressure high is illustrated by this point right here. So you see where the pressure goes up during the inspiratory phase and it holds that pressure for a set amount of time. Now from pressure high, we're going to release to a pressure low. This is our second setting we're gonna set. You'll see your pressure low right here. So this is P low. So we go from P high 
to P low. Those are the two settings that you have to set. And then we have to tell the ventilator how long to hold each of these pressures. And that's all the vent's doing. So you go pressure high for how long? And we're gonna call this time high. And then we drop to pressure low and we tell the vent how long to hold at that low pressure. This is where we see our time low down here. And those are the four settings. Now, of course, we always set FiO2. Uh, so you're always going to have that at your disposal. There's going to be a sensitivity setting. All of the standards are still set. But these are the four that, that we typically set. So this is kind of a shift in mindset away from, from inspiratory pressure, um, away from, from PEEP, traditionally how we know it, away from tidal volume and rate. We're going to talk about that here in just a second to where this is where we find ourselves um, in the game. Now, I will say just a little caveat out there, depending on what ventilator you're working with, APRV is sometimes referred to as bi-level. You can set these modes up to do the exact same thing. If you're working with the, the Pure Committed 840 or the 980, then you might see yourself um, not setting a time high, but instead setting a respiratory rate. It's still going to give you all of these four settings at the end of the day. So, um, where, so where do we set these? Now that we know what we're setting, where do we set them? So what we see here is that a common practice is for your P high to reflect your plateau pressure coming out of volume control. So typically you're in volume control, you know what your plateau pressure is. That's going to be a useful tool in knowing where to set your pressure high. Now, you're going to find out when we start to looking at and talk about the research here in just a little bit, you're going to see where there's not a whole lot of consistency in, 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 in how people are setting what, but the vast majority are setting it based off of plateau pressure, while others are setting it based off of peak inspiratory pressure, and others are setting it based off of a desired tidal, XL tidal volume. So, but, but the majority um, of people practicing with this mode are using plateau pressure as their target initial vent setting for the pressure high. Now pressure low, this is the one that, that really is kind of hard to grasp because we're gonna set pressure low at zero, typically. Now you can set a minimum pressure you can set a pressure of five, a peep of five, a low pressure of five, a low pressure of eight. But typically what we're seeing is that you set this low pressure to zero. And I'll explain why here in just a little bit. Your time high is typically going to range between four to six seconds, sometimes up to eight. And then your time low is going to be very, very small. This is typically in the ballpark of around a half a second, if not even less. Now, here's how you know where to set your time low. You set your time low set to capture 50 to 75% of your peak expiratory flow. Let me say that again. 50 to 75% of your peak expiratory flow, depending on the institution, pro the protocol you're working with and what kind of method you're going at. A lot of people are setting it at capturing at 75%, uh, but you're seeing others catching about 50%. Well, what does that mean? Capturing at 75% of peak expiratory flow. Let's go down here and look at our flow pattern here. This is inspiratory. Line comes that flow decelerates and then we hold and then you get a big exhalation period right here. This right here is your peak expiratory flow. You have to know what that number is. So let's just say that just to keep the math easy, let's say that that number is 100 liters per minute is your peak expiratory flow. If you're wanting to trap at 75% of peak expiratory flow, then what you're looking at is when does the, the flow decelerate to 75 liters? 75% 75 of 100 liters would be 75 liters. So if this is 100 here and this is 75 liters per minute, then you want that time low to hold for the time it takes to decelerate from 100 to 75 liters per minute. And then the next breath is happening immediately. Okay, so that's what we refer to when we talk about time low being based off of peak expiratory flow. 
You have to know that number and then set it and adjust it accordingly. And you know, the interesting thing about this is as compliance changes, your peak expiratory flow will change. And so you see uh, some data that supports just arbitrarily setting uh, the, the time low at a constant and leaving it there throughout the entire tire phase where there's other strategies that include constantly daily assessing uh, compliance and assessing that peak expiratory flow because we know as lungs become more compliant, your peak expiratory flow will reduce. Stiff, non-compliant lungs are going to have a very quick, quick expiratory flow as they release. And so we can kind of see here where this kind of becomes a moving, a dynamic setting that stays to par with where your patient's peak expiratory flow is. Okay, so we didn't, one thing we didn't talk about, um, and I told you there's not, is because we don't set a respiratory rate. And I see this a lot. I see where you see patients in APRV and there's no uh, rate documented. And, and it's not that there's not a rate, what it is, is that your rate becomes a byproduct of your total cycle time. And as respiratory therapists, we know total cycle time. That's our gig, right? This is our jam, total cycle time. So let's break this down and really look what's happening during these breath phases to understand what's happening during APRV. The breath phase begins right here. This is the beginning of the transition from P low to P high. And then remember, we're gonna hold up here for time high. We're holding at this pressure high. And then we drop to T low. The breath ends, the breath phase, if you think about it like a traditional breath phase, that breath phase ends there. Now, we know how long each of these phases are. We know we're holding at a time high of, let's just say, 5.5 seconds. And we know we're releasing and holding at a pressure low for 0.5 seconds. Let's just go with 0.5 seconds. Then if you recognize that these together total six seconds. So time high plus time low equals six seconds. And that is essentially our total cycle time. Now, what is that? That still doesn't tell me what my rate is, Joe. That tells me my total cycle time is. You're right. All we have to do now is go from take our total cycle time and divide it into 60. And we see that what we have here is that in one minute, we are going to get 10 of these drops. And while we don't call these breaths, they very much are very similar to them. You have an inspiratory phase, just because it's sometimes 10 times longer than your expiratory phase does not change the physiology of what's happening here. And then you have an expiratory phase and together they create your total cycle time. Now I told you if you were working with a different, uh, different ventilators that you might actually set a rate. Let me show you how you would know um, what your time high is in that situation. If you see in that situation, you know what your rate is and you don't have to do this math here, but then you don't know what your time high is. You have to actually calculate your time high. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. Let's say that we have a time low locked in at 0.5 seconds. And instead of setting our time high at 5.5 seconds, let's say instead we set a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute. Okay. Let's work with this. How do I figure out what my time high is? Well, if we know our rate is 10, then we can do the same thing we just did. 60 seconds divided by 10 breaths per minute gives me a total cycle time of six seconds. If I know that my time low is 0.5, then all I have to do is subtract 0.5 and I get my time high at 5.5 seconds. So you have to, this, this, is, this is, I think, a key component in, in understanding APRV is how this relates in, in when you're trying to manipulate things like time high or try to manipulate things like, like rate if we need to. Here in a little bit, we'll talk about um, how to add more drops or reduce drops. This is going to be key in understanding how all of that plays together. Okay. Let's just shift gears here for a second because we've been talking a lot about settings and, and what those settings mean and, and, and how they 
how, how we set them. But we really still haven't talked about what happens during APRV. We still haven't gotten to the nuts and bolts of what's actually happening. So I'm going to break this down for you in four key points that if you remember these four key points, I promise you'll be set up for success when working with APRV. The first point, number one, is understanding that these long and high pressure holds for an extended time high, what they do is they increase mean airway pressure. So if you remember mean airway pressure, mean airway pressure is everything beneath the waveform, right? The pressure waveform. So all of this is mean airway pressure. If you compare that to a standard pressure waveform, you see here where we have a massive amount more mean airway pressure established here in APRV than what we do in more of our traditional modes of mechanical ventilation. Now, why is mean airway pressure important? That's the question. Why? Why do we care about mean airway pressure? Well, we care about mean airway pressure because we know that mean airway pressure helps to recruit atelectatic regions and atelectatic alveoli. If we can sustain a higher mean airway pressure, then we can utilize collateral ventilation. I remember that, right? Pores of Cone, Channels of Martin, Canals of Lambert. We can utilize those collateral ventilation mechanisms to recruit and open up these atelectatic regions. In doing so, we increase FRC. We increase our functional residual capacity. And if you think about what that word means, you have a greater amount of functional alveoli. And that makes perfect sense. This is going to help us tremendously with oxygenation and making sure that our patients are oxygenating well. Now, the second point you want to remember falls, <clears throat> excuse me, in the drop right here. So what's the purpose of the drops? How come we just can't hold it at the pressure high the entire time? Well, the drops serve a purpose for bulk CO2 removal running out of room here. This big old board and I'm still running out of room. Bulk CO2 removal, okay? Which means that when you get this drop from pressure like that, what you see is you get a big exhale volume that uh, gets rid of a lot of alveolar CO2. That's going to help us manage our blood gases, manage our carbon dioxide levels, which is going to affect our pHs. We know this. Uh, when we think about MAP, we're thinking more about oxygenation when we think about the drops, we're thinking more about bulk CO2 removal. Now, this is going to be very important to understand when you start thinking about how do I address or, or adjust these settings for a particular blood gas that I might have. Okay, well, let's talk about it here in, in just a second. But I got two more points here to, to point out. So one is mean airway pressure. Two is bulk CO2 removal on the drops. Three brings us back to this point right here. Now, remember... We, we set this intentionally. We told the ventilator to start the next breath before all of the gas is exhaled. We're actually trapping 75%, depending on what, what, what method you're using, 50 to 75% of that peak expiratory flow. In trapping it there, what we're doing is we're intentionally creating auto peak. So this, this right here is point number three is intentional auto peak. Now, remember I told you back on the previous slides we were talking about settings that the P low is typically set at zero. Well, now you know why. Because while we're set at zero, you still never actually fall all the way back to zero. You wouldn't want that because that would be kind of counterproductive to all of the alveolar recruitment that's happening here and then you de-recruit. So you don't get full alveolar collapse because we are intentionally air trapping. We know that anytime the flow does not come back to baseline, then that tells us there's air trapping. Quick plug here for a November talk coming up here in a couple of weeks over airway graphics. Well, I'll be talking more about air trapping when we don't want it. But for today, we're talking about APRV. Auto peak is something that we intentionally shoot for so that we don't get full alveolar, alveolar collapse during the pressure drops. And then the fourth point that you want to remember is that spontaneous breaths are allowed throughout all phases of the pressures 
whether pressure high or pressure low. Now, pressure low, you're usually there such a short amount of time that there's really not much time for spontaneous breathing, but it's still possible. So what you see here is you can have breaths happening on top of the pressure high. The expiratory valve and inspiratory valve remain open throughout all of this phase, which allows for continuous spontaneous breathing by your patients. Now, this sounds like a good thing, right? We hear our patients spontaneously breathing, uh, reduce that, that, that diaphragmatic atrophy, and, and, and hopefully get them off the ventilator quicker because they have maintained this spontaneous breathing. These are the four elements of APRV. Remember, oxygenation happens with this big establishment of mean airway pressure. CO2 removal happens during the drops. We don't ever really get to the peak low of zero because we intentionally create a level of auto peak. And then four, spontaneous respirations are encouraged throughout all, mo all, all phases of the APRV. Okay, so let's take let's let's shift gears here for just a second, and we will um, let's look at a blood gas here and see what kind of change we would make for uh, this blood gas. Now, when you look at this, the first thing you notice when you look at this blood gas is is that our CO two and our pH these are good, right? We don't really see a big ventilation problem happening here. So, so the fact that we don't have a ventilation problem is a good thing, but we've got a problem right here. So we need to aid this patient in improving their oxygenation status. In doing so, we have two options. Option number one is we can increase P high. If we increase P high, we will increase mean airway pressure, which will hopefully aid oxygenation and get this 45 increased. Option two is we can increase time high. Now, by increasing time high, you're essentially going to hold it longer, which also is going to improve mean airway pressure. Now, understand, anytime you make one of these changes, you're also going to affect something else. So if you increase that time high, you are going to reduce the number of drops you have. And if you reduce the number of drops, when I say drops, I'm referring to pressure releases. A lot of, some people out there actually refer to APRV as CPAP with a drop. And, and so you kind of see that term being thrown out there during your drops. So if you increase time high, you reduce the number of drops. If you reduce the number of drops, then you reduce carbon dioxide removal responsible by the mode itself, which may affect this now, right? So just, just keep in mind what changes might happen when you're making those changes. But these are gonna be the two big ones to fix an oxygenation problem. Now, of course, you always have FiO2 at your disposal. So if you're, if you're on you know, 40%, then, then there's no reason why you can't increase the FiO2 um, to help adjust or, or to correct the hypoxemia. But in terms of mo or settings inside of APRV, these are the two that you're gonna look for for oxygenation issues. Now, if we, if we take a step back and look at the opposite, but here we see that our PaO2 is 75. And, and that's a good target, especially being that, that a lot of the data supports the use of this mode during um, ARDS and patients with severe shunts, severe oxygenation problems, where we're really targeting more like 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury rather than our normal 80 to 100. So we're okay with this. I'm not, this is not a problem for me. Uh, so oxygenation is good. What we do have a problem with is our ventilation right here. We've got a CO2 of 69 that is decreasing our arterial pH down to 7.24. We need to help this person get rid of more CO2. That's where we are now. We've got to help this person get rid of that. So how do we do that? Option number one, again, is you can increase pressure high. Now, now this is, may sound a little counterintuitive. We're like, wait a second, Joe, I thought that's what we did for oxygenation. Well, it is, um, but it also, when you increase pressure high, you also increase the gradient, which will lead to a greater amount of exhaled volume, which will lead to, to greater removal of CO2. But the better option, especially when you have an adequate O2, 
is by reducing time high. If we can reduce time high, what we will do is we will create more drops. So if you remember where we started with that example, we started with a time high of 5.5 seconds and we had a time low of 0.5 and this gave us a total time of six seconds, right? Which 60 divided by six gave us 10 drops per minute, 10 pressure releases. Okay, well, what happens if we reduce our time high by one second? So let's take it down to 4.5 seconds. Now your time low remains constant, remember? Because that is set based off of peak expiratory flow. So if you're ever trying to fix CO2, you're, 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 you start messing with the time low, you're gonna mess up that intentional auto peak that we uh, are desiring in this situation. So 0.5 remains our time low, and now we have a total cycle time of five seconds. Well, 60 seconds divided by five seconds equals 12 pressure releases a minute. So you can see just by reducing the time high by one second, we have created two more drops that are gonna allow for more CO2 removal and hopefully we can fix this arterial blood gas that's going on uh, that needs to be addressed here with this patient. So that's the, how, we gonna, that's how we're gonna adjust it based off of, off of blood gases. Remember, if you're looking for oxygenation, you're thinking mean airway pressure. If you're looking for ventilation, trying to find a way to get more drops. Now, here's the thing about APRV, and one of the reasons I think it's such a challenging mode is because there's so many different approaches to it, and there's so, many, so much uh, varying data on it. It doesn't seem like anybody really agrees on it. So what we're going to do here, just here real quick, is just look at some of the elements of what the research data says about APRV. So this is a combination of, of uh, four or five meta-analyses looking at APRV. Um, most of them are all related to ARDS. And, and what the first question is, and we'll kind of make this kind of interactive if you want to, if you have the um, ability to uh, comment down there in, in the comment section, I'm just going to ask you some questions. You tell me what you think. So the first one here is, Peak inspiratory pressure. What do you think the data shows when related to peak inspiratory pressure? Does it, is it higher than when compared to traditional modes of mechanical ventilation? Talking more about our, our volume control modes. Is it higher or is it lower? And Keith just said he can also turn your mic on if you want to jump in here and add to this. But right now, we'll just get through it. Just tell me in the comments right there, up or down, what do you think? I know we're not this shy. Down. All right, down, down, down. All right, so we'll get a couple of downs, and down is exactly the correct answer. This research shows overall you see a reduction in peak airway pressures. Now, what about mean airway pressure? What do you think here? This is a gimme, right? We've already talked about this. So when we think about mean airway pressure in APRV, 100% we see that it goes up. Now, if you just think, if we take just a second and we look at this, if, if you look at a traditional mode of mechanical ventilation with a pressure such as this, right? And let's say this peak inspiratory pressure was, I don't know, let's just say 32. And when you consider everything underneath here, let's say you have a map, a, a, um, a mean airway pressure of let's say 16, okay, just, just, just picking numbers. That's a feasible scenario. You got a peep of five, got a peep of eight, you got your peak inspiratory pressures hitting 32, and all of these pressures together average out to about 16. Well, look at the gap here. What do we have to do to get that map up? When we look at APRV, like we've been doing, we see that all of this happens, right? And so, and because we're only there, only at the pressure low for such a short amount of time, we may have a P high set of 30 and your map may be 26, 27. You can see how they're very much closer together than what's happening up here. And that's one of the benefits of APRV is the bringing together, being able to establish that mean airway pressure 
without having to suffer on the peak side of it. So, so, uh, so absolutely peak pressure goes down, overall mean pressure increases. What about PF ratio? What do we think? Does it go up, does it increase, or does it go down when compared to traditional modes? So I see some, I see some comments here, up, 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 up. Yeah, so this is very interesting because I just sold you on the value of mean airway pressure and how it aids in oxygenation. There are some studies that did reveal that PF ratio increases. Now the common denominator by this was that this was in early application of APRV. So a lot of times what we see is we're maxed out on everything else and then it's like, oh, let's try APRV. Well, that's, that's probably not the best time to try it. What they found was that early application of APRV did indeed increase PF ratio. But to be fair to the data, there's also data out there that shows no statistical difference in relationship to PF ratio. Now, this is interesting to me, but what you find is when you uh, take into account the limitations of these trials, you find that what are we comparing it to? If you compare APRV to somebody with a PEEP of five and 80% and FiO2, it's an extreme example, but just to make a point here, then surely we're going to see an increase in PF ratio. But if you're comparing it to traditional modes of mechanical ventilation, where you're on 60% and a PEEP of 18, well, in that situation, you may not see that statistical difference be as big, and it may not be a big improvement in your PF ratio in that arena. So, so that's where limitations come in to where, yeah, in theory, it seems like it should always increase PF ratio, but depends on what you're comparing it to. It sometimes reveals no values. What about hemodynamics? So we're going to talk about mean arterial pressure. Do you think APRV causes mean arterial pressure to decrease or does it cause mean arterial pressure to increase higher than compared to um, traditional modes of mechanical ventilation? What do you think? Getting a little harder here. I see that. Up or down, up or down. Well, the truth is, is that if you remember some of the hazards of mechanical ventilation, you definitely know that decreased venous return is a, a, a hazard associated with mechanical ventilation. So in theory, you think about that mean airway pressure um, as it increases and it becomes higher, you think to yourself, that's gotta be squeezing on the great vessels. That's gotta be causing a decrease in venous return. And therefore mean arterial pressure would have to decrease. Like this has to go down, right? Well, this actually it doesn't. The truth is, is that mean arterial pressure actually shows an improvement with APRV. And the reason that is, is because remember what's happening on top of that pressure high. Those patients are breathing spontaneously. Every time that patient's diaphragm drops, you get a negative pull intrathoracically. And what that does is actually improves and promotes and enhances cardiac blood flow through that drop in intrathoracic pressure. So, when you're in APRV with a patient breathing spontaneously, you 100% see overall an improvement in your mean arterial blood pressure. I thought that was interesting. I like that. I like that aspect of it. What about barotrauma? You think a patient with APRV is more likely to, to um, suffer from a pneumothorax or, or, or ventilator induced lung injury? So I've got one down. No, no, no. Good. The answer is there's no data. There's no statistical difference. There's data. There's just no statistical difference. There is, is, is the data that is there says that when compared to traditional modes of mechanical ventilation, that the risk for villar induced lung injury and uh, pneumothorax or equivalent. Now, let me clarify, that did not mean that it doesn't happen and it doesn't exist. It just means that it, 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 it was the incidences, the rate of incidence for barotrauma was equivalent to that of traditional modes of mechanical ventilation. Um, what about ICU length of stay compared to traditional modes? You think these patients are in a hospital um, longer or in the ICU longer or shorter? 
What do we think? You got a patient on APRV. On average, is that person going to be in the ICU longer or shorter? Shorter, shorter, shorter. That's exactly right. We actually see where ICU length of stay decreases. Now, this is related to several things. First of all, when you have patients who are allowed to remain spontaneously breathing, um, that's first of all. So you have diaphragmatic movement throughout the entire mechanical ventilation phase. That's going to lead to quicker extubation. They show a higher success rate with extubations, fewer tracheostomies, and, and, and fewer hazards when extubating. Now, um, that's one study that showed that. Now, there's other ones there that say, eh, the, static, the, the, the numbers are about the same. I don't really see much. But there was a significant reduction in at least one meta-analysis that was up to like 36% reduction in ICU length of stay. Now, for me, my mind automatically goes like this. If we're using less sedation and we're getting them off the vent quicker, then we have fewer vent days, we have fewer ICU days, then we obviously have a reduction in total hospital length of stay. However, that's not what it shows. There was no change in hospital length of stay. Now, again, I don't know what happens after we get out of the ICU and get to the, the general care unit, but there was no statistical difference. So it's, this is interesting to me, and I hope you find it interesting that, that there's data that supports we can get them off the vent quicker but, and out of the ICU quicker, but not so much out of the hospital quicker. And so probably more, more uh, research coming along that. What about 28 day mortality? Increased or decreased? Absolutely, 100% decreased. 28 day mortality also showed um, in, in, in one particular trial specifically a third, up to a 30% decrease in 28 day mortality associated with APRV rather than with um, standard, standard traditional modes of mechanical ventilation. Again, here we go back to this, right? ICU length of stay is down, hospital length of stay, nothing. 28 day mortality shows to be down, hospital mortality, no significant change. I don't know how to explain it. That's just what the numbers say. Um, but the numbers are, are interesting. If, if you really wanna get, get, get good in understanding APRV, um, start reading articles about it. Just, just get involved and, and see what type of research is going into it. At the end of all of these studies, everything supports the idea of more research is needed. And that's just the bottom truth of it, is that, that, that we need more quality studies being done on this, standardized so that we're doing it in the same fashion so we can find out the best way to operate uh, when we're using APRV. All right, now I'm gonna wrap this up here in just a few minutes, but before I do so, um, there's some frequently asked questions that, that are typically posed when we're talking about APRV. And some of these may even be more myths than they are uh, questions. But the first question here is, is, what if the patient is paralyzed? So what if the patient is receiving like neuromuscular blocking agents? Okay, that is not a contraindication for APRV. APRV can effectively oxygenate and ventilate a patient who is receiving paralyzing agents. So the spontaneous respirations we talked about, the benefits that come with them, 100%. Is it ideal? Yes. Is it absolutely required? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, there's the, the, the reference I'll point you to here in a minute, uh, talks from the, from put out by the AARC. Uh, they found that, that several facilities utilizing APRV utilize them with neuromuscular blocking agents. And so um, it is by no means a requirement that the patient uh, be spontaneously breathing. The key is that they have the ability to. Uh, what about weaning? How do you get a patient off of APRV? Well, if you think about what we've been talking about with APRV, you've got this pressure high and then you've got these drops and then back to pressure high, patients breathing spontaneously on top of them. What happens is, is as you see compliance improve, PF ratio improves, and, and, and your patient is getting better, then what we can do is we can start weaning down that pressure high. As the patient more effectively starts to remove more of their own CO2, 
by their improving condition, then we can also start getting rid of the pressure releases. So essentially, if you think about it like this, we have a patient getting something like this, APRV right here, right? Well, all we have to do is if we can eliminate, as the patient gets better, we eliminate that drop and guess what we see? Now we get that and the patient is still breathing right here on top of this pressure high. As we bring this pressure high down, what we see is that it essentially turns into CPAP. You have no more drops and you have your pressure high, then now you're just gonna go into CPAP and you're gonna wean and continue the weaning process from there. So the patient spontaneously breathing allows you to manipulate the pressure high and the time high to basically eliminate the drops until the patient is ready to go to CPAP and then extubate. There is no data or research that supports this idea that you have to go from APRV back into a volume control mode before you can start the weaning process. Okay, that's just simply false. Uh, let's talk about this right, real quick. What about driving pressure? So we know that driving pressure is a hot topic. Uh, a lot of people focusing on and, 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 and looking and monitoring driving pressure now because driving pressure has been uh, uh, shown to be associated with uh, mortality and, and ventilator-induced lung injuries uh, and things like that, right? The problem with it, with APRV, is, is that when you think about driving pressure, we know that driving pressure is plateau minus PEEP. That's the formula for it. That's how you calculate it, okay? It's plateau minus PEEP. Well, the problem is, where's our plateau and what's our PEEP? The argument is, is well, you can just say P high minus P low. And if your P low is zero, then whatever your P high is, that is your driving pressure. That's not true. This pressure high does not represent a true traditional plateau pressure, like what we know to be a plateau pressure in volume control. The reason it's not is for a couple of reasons. First of all, we are setting the pressure high. So, so you dialing that pressure high in, you are now establishing the plateau pressure. It's not something that you're assessing or is resulting from what you're seeing after you do an inspiratory hold after a given tidal volume. So, so the, the, the difference between these two do not accurately reflect driving pressure. Also, remember your patient in most cases is breathing spontaneously on top of pressure high. To get an accurate plateau pressure, you must have a, a static diaphragm to where you can see the actual pressure of the alveoli at rest. So that's really hard to do on top of that pressure high when you've got that patient breathing spontaneously. And then the last reason why it's really hard to assess driving pressure is because when we go to this pressure low, remember we're creating this element of intentional auto peep. But what we know about auto peep in this sense is that, is that, yeah, we can look at this and go, okay, well, our peep actually, we don't ever get to zero. We actually drop to six centimeters of water pressure. So we'll just use that. Well, even that isn't an accurate reflection of, of, of equal regional alveolar volume. Because what we know is that during the expiratory phase, areas that are compromised, areas that possess, that, are, that, have, that have a lower compliance than other areas of the lungs, those regions are going to empty much quicker than your more compliant regions of your lungs. And so, while you're trapping and creating this auto peak, you really can't use that in the term of how we calculate driving pressure. And so um, what the AARC says about driving pressure in APRV is that it's very problematic. The idea that you're shifting your focus to mean airway pressure and really off of the tidal volume delivered um, kind of shifts the focus away from uh, tidal volume and, 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 and therefore becomes problematic for the driving pressure discussion. Um, so, so that's what we talk about. We think about driving pressure and the challenges that come with it in APRV. And then what about COVID-19? Everybody wants to know about COVID-19, right? What does the research show about how uh, COVID-19 uh, responds to APRV? Good or bad? 
What do you think? Put it in the chat there. Do you think the results uh, show a good response or a bad response? Good with a question mark. Good, 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 good. Everybody's saying good. Uh, the answer is false. The answer is that it's not good, which is weird because you think and we in our minds, we wrap kind of COVID-19 into this a, into this ARDS ball. And we're thinking, oh, we've got all this information about APRV that shows positive outcomes for ARDS. So surely it would show the same for COVID-19. It actually showed the opposite. It actually showed the mortality rate in the APRV group was much higher than the standard traditional mode of mechanical ventilation in comparison to COVID when you're talking about patients with COVID-19. Can't make sense of it, but that's just what the data shows. Okay, um, let's wrap this up and then we'll think we'll have time for a few questions. Uh, remember to know your settings, there's four of them. Pressure high, pressure low, time high, time low. Remember those four settings. Remember pressure high starts around at or estimated at your plateau pressure. Pressure low oftentimes is set to zero. Time high is going to be based anywhere from four to six seconds to establish that minute ventilation. And then time low is based off of that 50 to 75% of that peak expiratory flow, depending on your institution's protocol. Four key points to understand it, APRV, mean airway pressure, is established and that helps us recruit more functional alveoli and should help us oxygenate our patients better. The pressure releases serve the purpose of, of bulk CO2 removal so that we can help the patient rid themselves of CO2 and help us establish a good pH. Uh, number three is the intentional auto peep. Remember, we're doing that intentionally so we don't reach full alveolar collapse by going all the way back down to zero. And then point four was your patients allowed to spontaneously breathe during both phases of this breath. Remember the focus here is on mean airway pressure. That is the magic that is uh, in theory helps to establish better oxygenation. If you have to get rid of more CO2, remember you need to create more drops. Do that by decreasing your time high and that will create more drops and help you get rid of more CO2. And then I just wanna leave you with this, the evidence out there is um is there and and i and i encourage you to go out and become a a student of your craft and a studier of the evidence because that's where the new stuff is coming from so it's interesting that aprv uh thought con was conceived in 1986 and here we are in 2021 talking about it sometimes like it's a completely foreign mode of mechanical ventilation so stay up to date on the research. Uh, here's the copy of my references that I've referenced throughout this presentation. If you would like a copy of these references, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You know where to find me. You can find me on Instagram at Respiratory Coach, YouTube at Respiratory Coach, Twitter at Coach RRT. Can you believe somebody snagged Respiratory Coach on Twitter? And then Gmail, you can email me anytime at RespiratoryCoach at gmail.com. Something exciting taking place right here. Uh, this is my new texting platform where uh, you get to join a community where once, twice a week, I send out sometimes motivational, inspirational, or educational content. You get it right there on your phone. Don't call this number. It's not a phone. It's just a, it's just a texting uh, number. Okay. But feel free to join that. You can just send me a text right now and uh, we'll get you involved with that. Other than that, I am right on time and I have time for a few questions. So um, if you want to throw, uh, what do you want to do, Keith? You want to turn the, allow them to turn their mics on? Anyone wants their mic turned on, all you have to do is chat us, say, please turn my mic on, or just type in your question into the chat feature and we'll answer it. But this is the time for a question and answers. Anybody have any questions for Joe here? If you do find yourself wondering, thinking, I forgot what was talked about, I forgot this, I forgot that, um, you know you can always send me a message and I'll, I'll get back to you um, as quick as I can. But, but I'm here to, to, to help you understand these concepts and, and, and help these things make sense so that we're all better clinicians. Oh, we have a question, I think. Okay. Uh, 
when we need, we adjust P high accordingly. How do we approach T high? Yeah, so let me go back a slide here. Actually, I'll just come over here. So if you think about it, like, like you said, you're going to, a, you're going to reduce this pressure high. So the pressure high is going to get nixed and you're going to start reducing this. And this is based off of your patient's oxygenation status. So you're seeing, you're watching your patient, your PF ratio is improving. You're looking at it. You've got, you know, good gas exchange happening. You're like, okay, let's start to wean this. So you're definitely going to start bringing the pressure down. Now, as you're watching the patient breathe and assessing their own spontaneous tidal volumes, you will get to a point to where the patient doesn't need 10 drops every minute. So you take, this is kind of what I was saying a minute ago is where you eliminate these drops. You do that by making your time high greater. I think that's the question. If you increase your time high, you will see that your drops start getting eliminated. So like kind of like that example I used a minute ago, if you're at 5.5 time high and 0.5 time low, you got a total six seconds. That's 10 drops per minute. Okay. Well, now let's take our, let's take our, our time high and let's turn it up to, let's just go 6.5 seconds plus 0.5. Now we have a total cycle time of seven seconds, right? I'm good at math, but not that good. So now we see here where we have 60 divided by seven. This is going to give us, that's not right. Yeah, six, yeah, eight and a half drops because here we were getting 10 drops. So we were getting 10 drops. We raised the time high. Now we get fewer drops. Take it up even higher, take it to eight seconds and you add it to 0.5. And now you see that your total, si total cycle time is now 8.5 seconds. If you do 60 divided by 8.5, now you're only getting seven drops per minute. And what's happening is the patient is, the patient is now assuming more of the ventilation responsibility on their own and through their own spontaneous information. I hope that answers your question. Okay, we have another question. Yep. You mentioned that APRV is essentially bi-level. Is, uh, is this true only if the IDE ratio is inverse to IRV? That is 100% true. That's a great question. When you look at bi-level, bi-level traditionally functions something like this. I'm just, just throwing some stuff out there, okay? not not doesn't have to be just like this. But you can see here, actually, hold on a second. So what I'm trying to do here is create like a one-to-one. -one. In bi-level, the patient can breathe also on top of both of these, these pressures. And so if you're utilizing a, a, a mechanical ventilator that, that operates with bi-level, you just have to learn how to lock your time low. And you just, you basically do exactly what you said. You create this crazy high uh, inverse I to E ratio that, that sometimes is 10 to one. So you just turn it to where your pressure high is holding much longer. Then you're dropping down and you have your time low set and you're spending one time, one half a second here and then rising right back up and going 5.5 seconds. You can do the same thing in APRV with, with a mode that, that uses APRV traditionally. You can make it operate like bi-level. Just make your I to E ratio not so drastically inverse, and you'll basically be in bi-level where the patient can breathe spontaneously on top of pressure high and on top of pressure low. That's exactly right. But the key feature of APRV is the very short pressure low right back up to the pressure high with that, um, with that in, 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 in extremely inverse I to E ratio. That's a good question. Okay, we have two more questions. How much trigger should we set? Uh, the trick, well, your trigger is going to be set on your, on your typical, the same as you're going to be on traditional mode of mechanical ventilation. It's just going to trigger for what the patient needs to, to initiate those spontaneous breaths. And so, you know, typically you see two to three liters per minute of flow trigger. Um, if you're using pressure trigger, then typically you're looking at, you know, two to 2.5 similar as water pressure in terms of, of, of negative uh, pressure trigger. 
those are all still the, they're still there. Those are still um, pretty much uh, the same. I haven't seen anything where recommendations for those are different. Okay, are there then, any populations that this mode would not be recommended for? Um, yeah, COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put the stamp on it like no, but uh, the data has shown where uh, it does not have a successful uh, track record with COVID nineteen. There's basically when you think about this mode, you're thinking about your patient population where you're looking at uh, oxygenation problems. So you have your your chronic hypercapnic patient that comes in um, with. Uh, a high CO2, that COPD or that's extremely acidotic and it's a pure, you know, you got a ventilation problem. I wouldn't be thinking um, APRV. The unilateral disease processes, um, you know, we don't necessarily, I guess it depends on, on more specifics in that. But from what I'm seeing, I haven't seen anything where it says absolutely no, do not use on this patient. I've seen no contraindicated populations. I do want to go back real quick, Keith, to that one question. Uh, how do we chart PEEP and eye time on ventilator charting? Uh, I think this is actually an element that needs to be talked to um, with your administration to see if you can get APRV charting in there. Because uh, in this case, you're going to have a hard time uh, documenting if all you can document is PEEP and, and eye time, you're going to be leaving out at least two specific parameters. Um, I guess you could call it delta P could be your pressure high and your PEEP low could be your standard PEEP. But first thing I would do is send an email to say, hey, I think we need to tailor make this charting to allow for accurate APRV charting. As long as the patient's not auto triggering, uh, then yes. And so if it, if it becomes easier, wait, what does that say? Does that say 10 or what? That says 10. Um, so a trigger set to 10 simmers of water pressure is essentially eliminating the patient's ability to trigger a breath. And, and um, I mean, I, that, that doesn't seem uh, humane to me uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the concept of humanity. Uh, I guess it depends on why, are we, why do we not want the patient to breathe? Why, why are we trying to eliminate their drive to breathe? Now, they still can breathe if they can generate negative 10 simmers of water pressure, but that's half of a MIP maneuver. And so you're, this patient is really having to work hard. Uh, I'd be interested to see uh, what the P100 reveals on a patient set on a, on a pressure trigger of 10. It'd be interesting to see. All right, any questions? Any other questions? Those are good questions. Thank you everybody for, for, for putting them up there and, and participating. All right, we're at the end of time. Is there any last questions before we uh, let you guys go? All right, everybody, my friend, Joe Lewis. Oh, by the way, I would like to mention, we do have a course on our website called COVID-19 Part Two. If you had taken that course, you'd have known the answers to some of Joe's questions here about APRV and COVID. Yes, Joe rocks. <laughs>